Okay, guys. So, uh, yeah, so what I want to talk about today is we're going to walk through a, what will hopefully be a fun example. I know so far, first half of the semester, a lot of what we've done in class has been these little snippets of things rather than actual useful code, right? So, uh, I was trying to start changing that a little bit last week by evaluating a poker hand, which is at least conceivably, you know, part of a game, right? So, um, I, I'm going to stay with text for now because uh, getting 2D graphics library set up is kind of a, a whole thing, and I think that's a little bit of a distraction for the scope of this class. But um, so, it, when I was thinking about what, what would be fun to do with it's still text, is chatbots. So chatbots have a long and illustrious history. Uh, who here is sort of Eliza? Anybody know Eliza? No. Okay. Awesome. I get to tell you about Eliza. So. Eliza was this really cool thing done in the 70s. So, who, who knows about the Turing test? No? Okay, all right, so, back, backtracking slightly. I promise I'll make this quick, but it's, it's good stuff to know. So the Turing test, Alan Turing, right, uh, who we talked about a little bit before, brilliant guy, probably one of the, the greatest minds of the 20th century, hands down. Uh, definitely, you know, up there. Uh, so he conceived of this test by which uh, you might be able to tell if a computer has consciousness. So, if, I, I'm not gonna get into the philosophy, that's all up to you guys, you know, everybody has different opinions, but if you think that it's possible for an actual mind to exist in a computer, if that's something that could happen one day, there's a question of how do you tell when it does happen, right? So, if something starts saying, hi, I'm a person, but it's a computer, how do you tell, right? So, the Turing test is, um, this idea that you have a, somebody at a terminal who's a real person. And then you have two things going on. They can talk to person A or person B. And they can type whatever they want, right? And then those two people uh, type stuff back. But the trick is, is that one of those people isn't a person. It's a computer program. So uh, Turing's kind of idea was that if, you know, somebody can, if it can fool a person, that's maybe not, uh, sufficient to prove that a computer has consciousness, but it's necessary, right? It's like one test you can perform. So anyway, so there's this long history of the Turing test. And if you narrow it down, now I, I would be pretty confident in saying that nothing exists right now that's a true artificial intelligence, but the Turing test has been passed many times for little subsets, right? And one of the first way, ways was with this very simple program called ELIZA. So, and there's this certain type of uh, uh, psychotherapy. It's called Rogerian therapy, right? And uh, the way it works is you say to the therapist, like, I'm not, I'm feeling kind of upset. And then the therapist says, just basically parrots back at you what you said, which can actually be really valuable. So they, they might say, well, why are you feeling upset? And um, you might say something like, I'm stressed about work. And then the therapist might say something like, uh, why are you stressed about work? Right, so going from I'm stressed about work to why are you stressed about work is a pretty simple manipulation of text, right? So in Harvard, I'm pretty sure it was Harvard, I'm pretty sure it was the 70s, a uh, psychology department actually wrote this program called ELIZA that would fake Rogerian therapy. And they got people that were at the time graduate students at Harvard in the psychology department to interact with this bot, right? And it fooled them. Uh, a bunch of people actually thought they were talking to a real Rogerian therapist because it was set up as we're going to let you have this teletype uh, interaction with this renowned Rogerian therapist. Anyway, so that's kind of all aside. But look it up. It's cool. It's an interesting little bit of uh, computer history. And um, there's a lot of research that's gone into how do you sort of fake uh, a conversation, right? So we're going to do a super, super simple thing that I'm not going to pretend like this would ever fool anybody, but it might be just good enough to be kind of funny. And, you know, since we're all talking about, we're in this class, we're all interested in games, you don't necessarily have to be correct all the time, you have to be entertaining, right? So, as long as it's kind of funny, it's fun. So, um, okay, so, that's what we're going to do today. And in the process, we're going to get to talk about a couple of things. So that's the sort of high concept. And what we're going to, the problem we're going to be breaking down is sort of a minimal chatbot. Uh, the techniques we're going to talk about in doing so are some string manipulation stuff. 
and we're going to look at how to read from a file. So we're going to have several text files we're going to read from that are going to feed into our little chatbot, and um, and we're going to you know learn a little bit more about strings. So let's do that. So I'm going to stop this, and I'm going to make a new project. Uh, week seven. So yeah, and I encourage you guys to all follow along with me. So we'll talk, call this talker. You can call it whatever you want. And I'll add a new source file. OK, so uh, you know this is a pretty simple app, but there's still a question of what do we build first, right? So uh, this is something you get better and better at the more you do, more, more programming you do, is breaking big things into small things, right? So the first thing I want to do is I want to set up a loop that will uh, just take input and respond, right? So <laughs> the, the first chatbot we're going to build is actually going to be really annoying and kind of punchable. We're going to make a chatbot that just mimics you, right? It just like says, uh, whatever you say, it's going to say back at you with quotes. So let's set that up, right? So we got to include some stuff, right? So I'm going to include IO stream. I'm going to include string. Uh, I'm going to include a uh, vector. We're going to use that later. And I'm going to include F stream. Uh, so, all right, so IO stream, that's standard. We've been using that a lot. It's for our CNC out. Uh, string standard, right, to let us manipulate text without the pain that is uh, using native C++ uh, character arrays, right? So we almost always want to use string. Vector, we talked about last week. It lets us have uh, variable length uh, list-like objects, which is going to be important in a, in a bit. And F stream, we're going to get to in a little bit that uh, is going to let us open a file and read from it. So almost all chatbots uh, have some sort of conception of s separate data, right? They have like a dictionary that they call from. Uh, in this case, well, I'll, I'll get to that later. So set up, oh, I want using namespace standard, int main, return zero. OK, so first off, I'm just going to uh, start with a greeting, right? So I'm going to say, hi, how are you? OK, so now what I want to do is I want to take in input, right? So what I want to do is I want to uh, let the user say something, and then I want to say something back, right? So. Um, I'm going to say string input. Oh. And so I, I have, there's a few different ways I could go about setting up a loop here. So I'm, I'm going to do it, I'm just going to type out how I chose to do it for this example, and I'll talk through it. So. OK, so I just typed a whole bunch of stuff. So uh, I'll let you guys type that, and I'll sort of talk through it. Right? So uh, what I'm doing is I'm setting is active to true. That, that's pretty standard. That we've been doing that for weeks now. right? One thing I'm doing, though, is notice my is active is within my main. This is a little bit better than what we've been doing so far. Um, so far in classes, we, we've just had a global is active. And we should always be suspicious of global variables. They're not always bad. Not always, always, always bad, right? But they're usually at least a little bit dangerous. If you can have something not be global, it's almost always going to be better. Almost always. So um, what I'm doing is is active true and while is active. Pretty standard, right? And then I read in, see in input, so I get something from the, the user. So far, this is all standard. But what I'm doing now is I'm saying is active equals process input. So uh, this is, you know, there's certainly other ways I could structure this. Personally, I feel that this is a fairly elegant way to do it, and that I'm having my process input um, function do some work on the input, 
which in a minute, it's going to mean we're going to take that input, we're going to parse it in some way, we're going to have some sort of response from our chatbot. But what we want to do is, if we get quit or queue, we're going to stop. Right? So you can, uh, you can talk to the chatbot as long as you want, uh, but you can quit at any time. Right? So uh, real simple, I'm just saying if input is quit or queue, we return false, otherwise we return true. So this will keep going as long as we're talking and not saying quit. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, good question. So, right, so you can absolutely have multiple returns in a single function. Uh, if you do, whether or not you do that is mainly a stylistic thing. So, this is something you'll see fairly commonly, and it's totally fine to do. Some people don't like it. Uh, I personally feel okay about it in this case, uh, obviously because I want to write it that way. Right? But what we're doing is basically we're checking for something that should just stop the function. So we've got a fairly easy, not a whole lot of logic going on, check for something that should end things early. Right? So in a minute we're going to have more going on in this process input. But I know that if I do hit a quit or a queue, I don't want to do anything else. Right? So all I want to do is just, I am done. Right? So in situations like that, it's decently common to have an early return. Now, it might look a little weird, and you're right to point it out, but it's totally fine to have multiple returns, although how many returns ever get used? One. Only one ever, right? Because as soon as we hit a return, that function is done. Nothing else can happen. Uh, the, the one thing about if you're going to have multiple returns, one thing you have to be really careful about, and I'm just going to make this a little more explicit. So I, I have this on one line, uh, which that's what I just had was is okay to do kind of if you're doing something really, really simple, right? So uh, what I definitely don't want to see from you guys, and I, I think almost everyone would, would consider it bad style, is if you have a, sort of a long line of code tied to an if statement, always put it in brackets. Right, so it is the case, if I left the brackets out, whatever the next statement is would still be tied to that if, but it'd be hard to read, right? So, anyway. So, this is a fairly common thing to do. Have some sort of if statement that, if true, uh, represents some, uh, some sort of condition where you just want to exit out early. You want to skip everything else, right? But what's a little bit dangerous about having a uh, return statement inside a conditional is you have to make sure that no matter what, no matter what, there's always a return value. So this function is not void, right? It's bool, meaning it, it's promising that no matter what, it's going to spit out a Boolean value. It's totally fine. And it's also totally fine to return early, right? What's dangerous, though, is we want to make sure that we have another return statement, that it is absolutely impossible to have any pathway through this function that doesn't hit a return statement. <clears throat> the only time that that doesn't matter is if you've got a void. So if this was a void function, we could have a return here, but we wouldn't return a value, right? So we would just say return early. And then this wouldn't actually, it would be redundant, because we would just have return at the end of the function. Which if we didn't have that and we hit the end of the function, that's essentially a return. You can almost think of the last closing bracket in a function, that is sort of in, an implicit return statement. So that's okay. But if you actually are returning a value, like we are here with a bool, you gotta make sure that everything, no matter what, returns something. So the mistake that you could easily make, not that you guys would, that one could easily make, is leaving this out, right? Because you see, oh, I've got one return there, right? But if this evaluates to false, then we don't return anything. It'd be easy to see here because the function's so small, but in more complex things, it's easy to skip that. Okay? Cool. All right, so, um, so that should work. Uh, I'm just gonna, I, I wrote a bunch of code without running it, so it's always good to just make sure everything's fine, so I'll say fine, and 
Yeah. So it's not doing anything with it yet, right? And if I type quit, we quit out. So that's all good. So um, cool. So it's always good to kind of like build up your uh, functionality in layers, right? So I know that what I want is a chatbot that kind of talks to me, right? That does something interesting, right? But at the start, I'm just going to have it do some sort of processing on the input, and I'm going to make a chatbot that would be very annoying, right? I'm just going to have something that takes what I said, puts quotes around it, and then says that, right? So, you know, it's going to ask, how are you doing today? I'm going to say, fine, thanks. And it's going to go, fine, thanks, and et cetera, right? And then we'll make it actually not annoying. So, OK. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give myself another function, right? So what I'm using is the process input. It might seem like I'm breaking it up more than is necessary, but there's very few problems you can get into by breaking your code down further. There's a lot of problems you get into by having more monolithic code. It does too much, right? So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have uh, a function that returns a string and takes a string. So uh, let's say chatbot bot mocking. So, and in a little bit, we'll implement a different chatbot, right? So this is just to get started. So we'll have sort of uh, similar, uh, similar functions that implement different types of chatbots. So we could go on and on and implement more complex ones. We're going to start with the simplest possible one. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say string, new string, let's say, equals OK. So uh, what I've done so far is uh, this looks a little weird, right? So what I'm doing is just to do something, right? So I've, I've come up with sort of, uh, and this is part of the art of programming, is coming up with the absolute minimal uh, thing you can do, right? So I know in a minute I'm going to want more complex processing to go on on this input, right? Because I might be working on, this might be a big project, and I might actually be writing a, a, a bot that can you know, talk you through mathematical equations. Um, or something, right? Which was also done in the 70s. There was uh, Newell and Simon's logic theorist that would just prove mathematical theorems, which is kind of cool. But anyway, so all I'm doing here is I'm adding quotes. Now, I do want to point this out. This looks really weird, right? So what I've got is a, a, sing, a double quote enclosed in single quotes. Because what I'm doing is I actually want the double quote character, right? So. Usually when we, we use strings, I, I do something like, uh, you know, something like this, right? We have double quotes and, um, and then some text inside, right? So in this case, I actually want a double quote. So I have to use single quotes around it to um, actually have that character. Because if I just have double quotes, uh, a double quote by itself means start a string. And then the next double quote means end this string. So if I had three double quotes, uh, the compiler would get all confused. So if I said something like, what's going on is this starts the string, this ends it, this starts a new string, and then that goes on till here, and then you know it's, it's getting all, all confused, right? So. Okay, and I'm also choosing, you know, and this is just a stylistic choice, it doesn't really matter either way, but what I'm doing is I'm returning the output. I could, if I wanted, uh, actually, you know, print out my new, my response inside my chatbot mocking function, but I'm just choosing not to do that. I, uh, personally, personally, the reason I'm doing that is because I kind of like the idea of process input, checking for quit, and doing the outputting, right? So I, I'm going to my chatbot functions. Uh, I want it to just be concerned with actually doing the text manipulation. So it's going to take in a string and it's going to output another string. Right? So uh, that's one choice I'm making, right? It's it's not necessary. I could certainly have the the print line. I'm sorry, C out here. Totally be fine. But I'm choosing not to. That feels cleaner to me. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, difference between what? Uh, on the string, there are two strings, but how can they be different? Oh, right. So w what I'm doing here is I'm just tacking on. So, you know, think of a really annoying person, right? So hopefully you, none of you have had this experience since you were like six, right? But, you know, back in like grade school or kindergarten or something, you probably had an annoying friend that would just repeat what, everything you said in an annoying tone, right? So that's kind of what we're simulating here. We're going to take everything that, you know, whatever the user says, and then we're going to put quotes around it just to make it seem a little snide. So you're fine, you know, that kind of thing, right? So that's what we're implying. So I, what I want is I want to take whatever we got as input, and I want to just tack two quotes onto either side. Right? But it's a little bit different because the quote actually is meaningful, so I have to wrap it in single quotes in order to have a double quote. Another way we could do it is we could escape the double quote. So, you know, if I wanted to end it with just, you know, like uh, a three, right? I could do that, right? So that's the character three, or just to make it clear, like E for N. Let's say I wanted to do that, right? So that would be fine. But if I replace this character with a double quote, that confuses the parsing. Because first double quote means start a string, next double quote means end that string, and then when we encounter another double quote, it means start a new string. So another way I could do it is by escaping it. So what that backslash is doing is every time you see a backslash in a string, it means the very next character means something slightly different. So we've been using that a lot, with backslash n, right? So we know that backslash n doesn't actually spit out an n, right? It spits out a new line character. So in a similar way, when I backslash double quote, what that's saying is I, I know the next character, it's a double quote, but it does not mean start or stop a string. What it means in this case is really, I, I really mean it, just print a double quote. I just mean that character. Oh, okay. So, well, uh, right. So, this is saying that we're returning a string, right? Well, so what's similar about them is in all three cases, we're, we're saying we've got a string, right? So, here we're saying we're returning a string. Here we're saying we're taking a string as input. And here I'm just, it's pretty trivial in this case, right? I'm, I'm making a new string. I don't really have to in this case, because what we're doing is so simple. So, I could just say return this, and that's fine too. Yeah. Actually, this is being interpreted as a character, but that's kind of more than, it, it's not that important for what we're doing right now. Uh, okay, so let's try running this, right? So, hi, how are you? I'm going to type fine, comma, thanks. Now, we see two, there's a couple things going on here, right? Uh, so it's kind of working. We see fine, thanks, right? What we really want is, we want that as one line though, right? So uh, what we're getting is this is spitting out two things when it really should spit out one. So what's going on there is when we're grabbing a string from the input, it's, uh, it's, getting, it's getting the words separately. Right? So I want to change this a little bit, because I definitely for the sake of a chatbot, I want the user to be able to type in a whole sentence. And uh, there's, you know, it's not really going to matter that much for this example, because it's so simple. But if we really wanted a chatbot that was sophisticated, we would need, there's not a lot we can do with single words, right? We need to know the structure, right? We need to know the whole sentence that they're saying. So we want to process things on the sort of full line level, not the word level even though we are going to be processing at a word level, but anyway, getting ahead of myself. So, okay, so how do we do that? So the problem is this, this right? So CN input uh, is, that's kind of where the problem is. That's what we need to change. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to type it, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so I'm going to use git line. So, just to be clear, this is part of standard, so, you know, we're using namespace standard, so that's all cool. 
but I'm going to say standard get line or leave std colon colon out because we're using, using namespace standard. So what's going to happen here is get line is going to read an entire line from something. But what we have to give it is we have to give it a source and we have to give it a destination. So what I've got here is the first thing is the source. So CN is just saying standard input. So whatever we would normally get from CN, in this case, it's the console, just typing into the console, right? Uh, that's where we're pulling the line from. And then where does that line go? Well, to the input. So what that's going to get, get us is rather than giving us pieces, it's going to give us an entire sentence worth of content. Now later, we're going we're gonna to have to break that up into words, but we want to take the whole sentence, break it up into words, and then process that. Because we want to know everything that's being said. I can't really tell much about what's being said if somebody just says it, right? What does that mean? I, I don't know, right? So I need to you know, get something like it is raining, right? And then I can say, OK, we got an it. We have this verb, you know, and then we've got this, this condition, you know, raining. So anyway, so I'm going to run it again. And now if I say fine, comma, thanks, we get fine, thanks. Okay. So pretty annoying chatbot. But we'll make, it, we'll make it a much more polite chatbot. Not the smartest chatbot, but not willfully annoying. Right? Not a mocking chatbot. Okay. Questions so far? Yeah, Ricardo. Yeah, so you want to look at what the errors are? So let's see. OK, so, well, so you, what you want to do is read the errors. So uh, one of the things it said is you have ISO stream. So it's IO stream. Uh, yeah, so you've got, you want to get rid of that S. This needs to be IO stream. And it, you need an E there, too. So stream, IO stream. There you go. So that'll get rid of one of them. And then you want to try running it again. So hit F5. And now, hold on. So now you want to see, OK. So what we want to do is we just want to look at each one and see what's going on, right? So oh, all right. So one thing, this, this is probably the thing I, I think is it blows my mind that Visual Studio does this. Uh, so it's an IDE. It's one of the most used IDEs in the world. And it defaults to not having line numbers on. That's insane. That's just totally insane. So if you're ever evaluating any sort of text editor for programming use, right, first, one of the first things you want to know is does it show line numbers, right? It should never not have line numbers on. So um, because when you get error statements, you're gonna, it's going to tell you, like, there's a problem in line x, right? So make sure when you're using Visual Studio that you've got line numbers on. It'll drive yourself crazy if you don't. So, um, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, customize, right? no, options. Not only do they have it off by default, but they kind of bury it, too. So tools, options, uh, text editor. General, I think. Right? All languages, there we go. Thanks, so. Arnold. Uh, line numbers. Somebody should be fired over that. I, that's like how bad that is. That's ridiculously bad. So you absolutely want line numbers on at all times. So I'm going to hit OK. Now we get line numbers, which is the only way to write code of any length. You have to have line numbers on. So uh, yeah. That's interesting. Can you see? Yeah. Is that because I didn't create your project? Just remove everything? No, it should be fine. 
Although, oh, well, it might be it might be getting an error, and it might be running the old version. So let's let's make sure. All right. So ah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's running the last successful build. Uh -huh. So it says that it can't write to here for some reason. Is there a problem with Z? Maybe a, a hard drive that you've removed? Oh, it's score drive. Huh. You might want to try making a new project, like on documents or something, because yeah, I mean that's that's the issue, right? So it, it can't open for writing, uh -huh. and it's running an old version. So. Okay. So now we should. So you want to get line numbers? So tools, options, uh, scroll down, text editor. Open that up. If you want to expand. Yeah, so all languages, and now click on line numbers. OK, now click OK. All right, there we go. OK, so we had an error. I think it was line 18. OK. OK, so, so the problem here is that you're, you don't have curly brackets. So this, is, so this is a function definition, but all of this is floating. So uh, every function has to have opening brackets and closing brackets to contain it. So, yeah, if you look at, do you have my screen? Oh. Yeah, and get that, yeah. So right over here. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So, um, just want to keep moving so we, we get all the way to the kind of conclusion here, right? Um, Okay, so we've got a really annoying chatbot. I wouldn't like this, this bot, personally, right? So let's make a nicer chatbot. This is something more interesting. So what I'm going to do is we want something that can actually respond in some way, right? So um, how do we do that, right? So, there, so just to, for the sake of saying it, chatbots are a huge topic. There's a lot of fun stuff that's been done. Um, I think one, one, there was even like a, people have done stuff like made artificial schizophrenics. And there's even, it was called Perry, an artificial paranoid. And somebody hooked that chatbot up to Eliza for a therapy session. It was great. Hilarious, right? So um, there's a lot of good stuff out there, right? But I'm going to do, I'm going to basically do one dumb trick here, right? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, uh, actual language processing is very hard, right? Natural languages are very, very complex things. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take in a sentence, and I'm going to look at each word. And if I find, I'm going to basically just have a list of words I don't care about. So if I was making a real language processor, I would need to care about things like if and 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 the and is and all that kind of stuff, right? But what I'm going to do is, like, if I say something like, uh, it is raining, right? What I can do is I can just ignore the it and is and assume that the, the user said something about raining, right? And so what we're going to do is we're going to you have this concept of what the subject is, and we're going to define subject in a very simple way. It's just going to be the first word we find that's not on a list of common words. So we're going to ignore things like the, and, it, but, you, I, I'm, all that kind of stuff, right? And whatever's left is going to be the subject. And we're going to do sort of like a, a almost like a Liza kind of trick, where we're just going to say something about that subject. And if we don't find a subject, we'll say something random, right? So at this point, this is where these files come in. So uh, if you grab these Word files, right, which hopefully everybody did, I'm going to open them up. So we get three text files. So I kind of thought it was uh, easiest to kind of separate them out. And what you want to do is put these wherever the, your source.cpp file is. So, well, first off, let's look at what they actually are. So I've got this words file. This is the first one we're going to use, is words. And oh, I have to extract it first. All right, I'll extract it to uh, desktop for now, let's say. So if you go to the class site, go to example code. And then at the very bottom, the simple chatbot link doesn't work, but the word files do. You can also make them yourself, but uh, at least this one is kind of an, you know, would take a little bit of time. So, uh, so 
So if I bring those up, I should have them on the desktop now. Let's Okay, so where you want to put them is wherever your, your CPP file is, right? So uh, in this case, this is where my project is. It's Documents, Visual Studio, 2015, Projects, Week 7, week seven Talker, wherever you guys put it, right? That's going to be different depending on where you guys are. But um, I'm going to go to Talker, and I found my source.cpp. So that's where I want the text files to be. Uh, I'm going to give myself a new browser, and I put them on the desktop. Uh, it's not on the desktop. All right, let's. Well, I'll go to downloads. That's fine. Go to downloads. I'll just extract them to downloads. We get Word files. Okay. All right, so you should see three, and I'm going to move them over to wherever my source.cpp is. Now let's look at, at words.txt. Oh, that's odd. Uh, let's see if I can open this with something better. OK. Uh, I don't know why Notepad was being, all right. So Notepad leaves a lot to be desired. WordPad is also, just to be clear, don't edit anything that's code-like with WordPad, because it, it's kind of a light word processor. Uh, and word processors are really bad for stuff like this, right? Because essentially what I, what I want, right, and what I've got here is just a simple text file with one word per line. And you can see the type of words I've got, and it's not very big, is if, and, but, the, how, in, or, you know, et cetera, right? So all the stuff that does give a lot of structure to language, but for our very, very simple chatbot, I don't want I don't want to say, I had a cousin that was really into many, you know, like that doesn't make any sense, right? Um, okay. So uh, if you're looking for a good text editor, by the way, I'll just plug this. It's, uh, it's free-ish. It eventually asks you for like 20 bucks, but you can use it for free indefinitely. Sublime Text 2 is really nice. It's, I really like it. Uh, it's also nice that it's cross-platform, and it, um, once you buy it, if you do buy it, you just, you know, you, it's kind of like Minecraft. You just have an account, right? So you can put it on all your computers. So Sublime Text 2, really, really good. Programmer-friendly text editor. There's a lot of them out there, but it's one I like. You guys might like it too. Uh, on Windows, you want to be careful though. Notepad is not really that trustworthy, and WordPad is definitely not trustworthy. So, because uh, it tries to be a text editor. So it's got to put extra data into that text file, potentially, which is dangerous. So just watch out for that. Uh, okay. And so conceptually, what we're, we're going to do is we're going to read this in, we're going to take each line, and that's going to give us a, sort of a, a bank of words to ignore. So, um, all right, so now we've got two things we need to do before we can for our next like, sort of milestone in the, this little project. One, we have to be able to take our sentence and break it up into words. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But we also want to make sure we have a bank of uh, words to ignore, too. So let's do that first. OK. So what I'm going to do is I, I don't want to assume any particular number of words. So what do I want to store my words in? Do you think? There's a big hint in one of the things I've included that I'm not actually using yet. We talked about it last class. Vector. Yeah, so I want a vector of what type? What, what goes into it? String, right. So I want a string vector. And I am going to have this be global because we're going to make use of this in a couple places. So I'm going to say, uh, whoops. I'm going to say vector string, and I'll call it common words, let's say. OK. Uh, and then I'm going, to go back down, I'm going to go down to main, and I'm going to make sure that the very first thing I do before I start getting into my loop of processing is I want to initialize my common words. So I'm going to call a new function, which I'll, I'll define in a second. So I'm going to say init common words. So now let's actually define that, right? So OK, 
OK. So now we get to read from a file, which is actually really easy. So uh, this is pretty standard. Uh, I've got a bunch of so this is, again, a really simple example. But one of the things we're seeing is I could, I totally could, have all of those words in my source code. That would work. It would technically be fine, right? Uh, why don't I want to do that? What's bad about that, do you think? Which act? That's, that's a really good point. It's not easy to access right from other files. Now, we, we could, we could um, fix that. There are ways around that, right? So we could absolutely make it accessible to other parts of our program. But the, the biggest downside, though, is if I want to add a word, what do I have to do? If I want to add a single word, and it's in all of my code, what do I have to do? What do I have to do if I want to change my code and have the result take effect? I have to recompile, right? Every, so recompiling to add a single word is not good, right? It's a little bit like, you know, if you, um, so it's a key thing, and it applies a lot, especially to game design. You don't want to have your data baked into your code base. That's really bad for a lot of reasons. Main reason is, is you generally want to change your data a lot, especially with games, right? So, you know, games, there's implementation and then there's tuning, right? And games are almost never fun until you tune them, right? So, and uh, if you're working with a professional game designer, or you are working as a professional game designer, a lot of what your time is going to spend, be spent doing is tuning things. You're going to work with spreadsheets, right, to make sure that, for example, the, the progression curve is just right, right, because that makes or breaks a game. So um, if you have to recompile the entire game every time you want to you know, make a certain aspect of it a little harder or a little easier, it's not so good. So um, if, if your role on a project is doing the engineering, you want to make sure you're reading from data files when it makes sense to. So in this case, we, we shouldn't have to recompile everything if we want to add one more word to our dictionary. That's bad, right? So I'm going to read from a file. Meaning that every time the program starts up, it'll read from that file, and all I got to do is change stuff in a text editor. I, I can totally give that to somebody that's not an engineer and say, hey, I, I stubbed it out with five words. You go in and you fill out you know, the 500 words that we actually want, right? Uh, and that's your responsibility as an engineer to do that, right? It's not necessarily your responsibility to fill out all of those words. It is your responsibility, if you're doing engineering, to make it accessible to other non-technical members of your team. So always be thinking about that. It, this is a really simple example, but you should always be thinking about how can I, make, uh, can I expose things to my teammates in a way that they can you know, reasonably change them. Right? So uh, anyway, that's kind of a big topic. Gets into something called you know, data-driven design, essentially. OK, so that's all backstory. So let's actually open a file. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new F stream uh, from a, a given file. Right? So, I'm just going to type this out. OK, so, um, and actually, before I forget it, I'm just going to do this. I'm going to say, OK, so let's talk about that. So I, 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 this is a type of initialization that we haven't seen yet. So what I'm, I'm doing here is I'm making something of type if stream, which is for file stream is what, what it is. So it's, it's a, a way to get a handle onto a file. Right? And I'm passing in, and this looks like a function. And it sort of is kind of. It's basically a constructor for this type of data. So I'm giving it a location. So uh, the details, we don't have to go too deep into the details, but the upshot is, is we can use this to open a file. That's one easy way to open a file. The really important thing, though, is anytime you do this, I recommend as soon as you've typed this, out, this line out, you immediately add this line, which closes the file. 
Now, we're going to want to do some work with it before we close it, but this is another way in which C++ can be dangerous. You don't want to leave references to files around. Because what we're doing is we're basically saying, hey, computer, crack open the, the, the file that's at this location. And then what this, what this actually is, is kind of a handle to that file. So we've opened the box, and we've got something kind of holding onto that box. And it's really important that we release that when we're done. So that your system can clean up things and files don't stay open forever. And you, know, you can get into situations where, like, you know, uh, you can't delete it because there's a reference to it, right? So let's say you've got this file, and, you know, it, for whatever reason, you're reading from a file, you want to delete that file, but you ran through the code once and you didn't close it. So that might keep you from deleting the file. So just, it's really important housekeeping. So I recommend anytime you're working with files, as soon as you've opened it, add a close. And then in between, we'll add the actual work we want to do. That applies outside of C++ too. There's another thing that uh, other languages will make nicer for you. It might be the case in a, in a different language that not having close won't do anything that bad, but you should always explicitly close the file. Just because it's good, it's safe. And just because it, it doesn't break as badly in other languages doesn't mean it's not important, right? So, another good reason to learn C++ first. Forces you to have really good habits. Okay, so at this point, We've done something pretty cool, and that we've got it. We can actually start using this file. We can make use of this file, right? So, uh, you know, file formats come in two main flavors: text and binary. Uh, reading a, a file can be very complicated. Like if we're reading a, a binary format, it gets into you know pretty involved stuff potentially. Uh, but it's real simple. In this case, we just have a list of words, one word per line. So, really simple. Uh, so what I want to do is I just want to grab all the words, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say string, string, ah, word. And I'm just going to type this out and then I'll explain. So I'm going to say while, get line. Okay, that's all I need to do. So, uh, well, just to make this clear, I'll do this. I'll... So I've got while, get line, word file, comma word, and then inside there I'm going to say common words, push back words. So I'll talk about that more in a second, but I'm just going to say C out, found, common words, dot size, Okay, if I run that, we should see found a bunch of words. Found 32 words, good. So, okay, so let's talk about what's going on here. So, I'm using get line again. So, um, a couple minutes ago, I used get line to get a full line of input from the user, right? And my first argument to get line was cn. And then my second argument was, you know, something to hold uh, what I got, right? So I'm using get line again, and it's in, since it's the same function, I have the same type of input, and that the first argument is a source, and the second argument is a destination. So the big, the big difference here is instead of having C in to mean uh, the default input stream, what I've got is a file stream. So uh, what's really going on there is something kind of cool and something we'll touch on again in, uh, when we talk about classes is polymorphism. So that's a, that's a big word. But what it means is, you know, when we make a function, right? So my uh, mock chat, chatbot mocking, right, took in a string and spit out a string. Now, if you're thinking to yourself that uh, a handle to a file is probably a little bit different than our standard uh, console, you'd be right. It is different. But one is a OS, OF stream. I think, I forget exactly, but it's, it's some other type of thing. And a file, this is an F stream, a file handle, right? But they both inherit from another higher level class. So it's kind of like, you know, a dog and a cat are different animals, right? But they're both mammals, 
And you can go up from there. You can say they're both animals, too. Uh, so you can go, you know, kind of like, you think of like a living thing, right? You can go down to animal. From there, you can go to mammal. From there, you can go to, uh, I'm sure cats and dogs are title related, but, I, you know, there's a branching structure there, right? And eventually, you get to the separate ideas of dog and cat, right? And even though they're different, they share a lot, right? So if, you, if I want to talk about mammals, you know, that's, I can talk about mammals, right? Um, so in a similar way, what GitLine is looking for is something that, the first argument, rather, is something that's a valid source to get a line of text from. And there are a couple different sources we can use. So uh, CN totally works, because CN is defined as a type that, you know, works, that can provide text data. And a file handle works too. So even though they're two separate sources, this is implemented in such a way that it can take either. So it's kind of like, you know, if we want to talk about, um, you know, the biology and the biochemistry of hair production, right? That's not really part of a dog. It's part of mammal, if that makes sense. Because right? all mammals have hair, right? It's one of the defining characteristics of mammal, right? So, um, right. So we've got get line. First argument is something that can provide a line. And then second argument is where to put it. So again, source and destination, uh, but we're using a different type of source in this case. We're, we're using uh, a file handle. Okay. So, and the nice thing about this is that overall, so this is something that I don't think we've seen yet either. And that I've got a while loop, right? We've definitely seen while loops. Uh, but inside here, right? When we talked about while loops, we, I said that they, we have to give it a conditional, right? So this is something that is a little odd, but you'll see really often, And that what I'm doing is I'm running a function. And that function is kind of set up to work well with this, in that it's going to read a line, right? And one of two things can happen. Either there's going to be another line to read, or there's not. And if there's not another line to read, it's because something like, you know, we hit the end of the file in this case. At some point, we're going to be at the end, and there's no more to read, right? And it just so happens that get line will, ev the return value of get line will evaluate to false if we have hit the end of whatever we're reading. So that makes this really compact and easy, but I just want to point out that we're doing something a little involved here, and that this function gets run and it outputs something that can be interpreted as a true or false value. So that's something you can definitely do in your own code too. You can, you know, like have, uh, you might, you know, um, this could be like, you know, uh, apply damage to enemy, right? And it might spit out whether or not they're still alive. So it might be something like while uh, take damage, enemy reference, amount of damage, and then, you know, have the enemy attack you or something like that, right? And then when that enemy has taken enough damage that their health drops to zero, you can make your take damage spit out false. That would stop. So uh, anyway, not necessarily how I would do, you do that specific case, but uh, upshot is this is going to read one line. Let us go through, do something with it, and I'll keep doing that until there's nothing more to read. So in this case, all we're doing, we're not really doing much with that at all. All we're doing is we're just pushing it back onto common words, right? So uh, one th you'll notice that we never defined, uh, we never said, we never created, this might look weird if you guys are used to other languages. We never, it seems like we never really created common words. We said we're going to have a vector holding strings named common words, but that's all we had to do. In C++, this created a thing. Right? So that declared it. We declared it, it exists. So, and since we declared it in global scope, that's all we need to do, and we can push stuff onto it. So at this point, uh, you know, I've got this as just sort of a debug, debug thing. Uh, I can see that we're reading in 32 words. Okay? Okay. All right, so now let's start on our chatbot. So, Say string nicer or chatbot nicer.
string input. Okay, so first thing I want to I want to do a couple things here. So, um, uh, so let, let me open up those two other text files. You guys might have looked at them already, but I want to talk a little bit about talk a little bit about uh, how they work here. So I've got statements and random statements. Okay, so. Um, so what I've got here is I'm going to take in some input, <clears throat> and I'm going to try to find a subject in that input. Right? So if I find a subject, if I find something that's not on that list of common words, I want to say something about it to sort of simulate some sort of conversation. Right? So here's, what, here's how I'm approaching that. Right? So I've got a bunch of potential statements. And what I've got is two ampersands. Why two ampersands? Well, what that represents is I'm going to replace the two ampersands with whatever the subject is. So if I say something about, um, you know, dog, right? It, would, it might say, tell me more about dog, or what have you. Okay? And I'm using two ampersands just because that's not likely to come up. It's text, so it's easy to, you know, use string manipulation to find it, which we'll see in a minute. But I can't think of any situation where I, I would actually use two ampersands in conversation, right? So it doesn't matter what I'm using there, so long as it's not going to come up in normal English, and I'm consistent. So it's just a placeholder. So basically what I'm doing here is kind of like Mad Libs. Right, so, um, so, OK, so I'm going to choose one of these randomly if I find a subject. But it, I'm not guaranteed to find a subject, right? So I might, you know, if the user says something like, it is now, or something, right? Now, a really good chatbot using sophisticated AI, which Rez could probably tell you guys about, would do something like do some reasoning to figure out that it me refers to what I was just talking about three sentences ago. Right? That can happen, but it's way beyond the scope of this example. So I'm just going to say a random statement. And I'm reading both of those. So one file is random statements that I use if I don't find a subject. Other file is I'm going to grab a random. Uh, I, from when I find a subject, and I'm going to replace part of it with whatever that subject is. Okay. Questions on th that approach? Cool. It's dead simple, but starting with this, you can you can make some cool stuff. So okay. So first thing I want to do though is I want to find that subject, right? So. Um, Right, so what I need to do is I need to take that input string, I need to break it up into words, and then I need to check each word against my list of common words. So breaking it up into words is going to be a little tricky. So one thing I like to do when I'm working through something is I just start by commenting, right? So my chatbot nicer, what's it going to do? Well, first off, first break input up into words. Then I want to check words. Well, I'm going to say look for a subject by checking against common words. If subject found, choose random string, replace with subject. You guys don't have to type this, all this ad, you know, or use your own words or whatever. But uh, uh, otherwise, choose random statement. OK, so th those are all the things I need to do, right? Uh, that can be a really good way to start to get a handle on a hard problem. Just kind of you know, just think about what needs to happen and then just break it up piece by piece. So first thing I want to do is I want to break it up into words. Now that might seem weird, right? Because we specifically use git line instead of cn so that I'd get the, all the words together, right? But um, and now I'm just, it seems like I'm kind of undoing that, right? But it's still, it's crucial that if we were doing a sophisticated chatbot, which we're not, but if we were, uh, we would need to process on the, at least the sentence level, right? That's kind of the, 
the smallest we can go and still have any sort of context. But we can't process a sentence all at once, because if we did that, we'd be left at just like looking at one, like basically saying, if we get exactly this sentence, do something, right? What we want to do is break it up and see that, okay, we have this relationship and do some sophisticated processing. So, okay, so I'm going to split it up into words. This is a little bit unfortunate. It's um, more complicated than I would like it to be, honestly. So, um, lots of languages have really, really nice features to let you just break up a string into an array based on a character, right? So, this is a very simple thing to do in other languages. It's a little more involved in C++, um, but it's okay. No, it's fairly straightforward. So what I have to do is we have to kind of do it ourselves a little bit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a space. Once I know where a space is, so let's say I've got, you know, OK, so let's say I have it is raining is my string, right? So what I want to do is I want to find the first space. So here's the first space. So once I've done that, I want to grab a substring. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab, OK, so we find out 0 is not a space, 1 is not a space, 2. That's our first space, right? So that's a space. So what I'm going to do is I want to grab the first two characters. And that'll give me it. So I'll say, OK, that becomes a string. Right? Then I want to keep reading, and I want to find the next space. So I'll find another space, add 3, 4, 5, and I'll grab this, and that'll be something, right? That'll be is. And then I read to the end, right? And this gets a little bit like what we saw last week with uh, uh, checking a poker hand to see if we had a straight, and that I'll need to make sure I, I collect it at the end, which we'll see in a minute, right? But uh, the nice thing, so the bad news, right, is we have to do a little more work than you might want to do. The good news, though, is it allows us to talk about how you find a string in another string, which is a really uh, important thing to be able to do. So I'm going to type some stuff here. Okay. So I'm going to make another vec vector, vector, string, words. Because right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, uh, I don't know how many words I've got. I, I definitely want a, a list-like object to hold them. So I'm going to say words. I know this is a bunch of stuff, but it's easier to just let me type it out, and then we'll talk through it. OK, so that'll almost work. Uh, it'll get everything but the last word. But it, that's a lot of code, so I want to talk through it. OK, so first off, I initialize two things. I give myself a, a container for all the words. So vector words, right? Words, uh, plural. And then I, I give myself a string for a word. So I'm going to push stuff onto here, right? And I'm going to, each individual thing is going to be in word. Right? So, um, OK. So what's going on is we've got this previous position. That's, we started 0 uh, and space position. Uh, so this is where it gets interesting. So the string library defines this function find. Very, very useful. And what it does is it lets you search for a given string inside another string. But the key thing about it is not, well, not only that, but it also asks you to say where to start looking. So what we're saying is find me the first instance of a space and start looking at the very start of the string. So this is saying start at index 0. So if it is raining, it's i, right? So start here and find the first space. And what it's going to spit out is an integer. It's going to spit out an integer uh, that tells me where the first space is. Now, one kind of tricky thing 
So I've got um, while space pause not equal standard string in pause, right? So what in pause is is um, it's a it's basically a, it's a it's it is an integer, so we can test against it. And what it, it means is it's it's used as a marker to mean no position. So it is an integer, but the value of it doesn't matter. It's basically just a constant defined as part of the string library that can be used to test whether we found something. So let's say we look for something that doesn't exist, right? So let's, um, let's make this. So I'm not actually using chatbot nicer yet. But what I will do is I'll, I'll go to my, my main, right? And I'll say string uh, needle. So what we're looking for, right? Equals capital A, let's say. And string haystack equals BBA. BBBA, let's say, right? I'll see out haystack.find needle. Zero. OK, so let's see what happens there. Oh, and I got an error. Oh, OK, so it's, it's um, whoops, sorry. So it, uh, it, I, I was in the middle of writing chatbot nicer, and it's, it doesn't return anything yet, right? So I'll just return input for now. We'll make it actually return something in a minute. But um, again, anytime you've got something that's not void as a return value, right? That's a, a, a contract you're making with the compiler. You're promising to always return something, right? So I didn't have any sort of return, so the compiler didn't like it. And you run there. OK, so let's run that now. OK, so I found 32 words, but then we see three. So what's the three? The three is? Zero, one, two, three. Right. Now, let's say I look for C. Now, there is no C, right? Now, we get some big integer, right? Doesn't actually matter what that value is. We're never meant to actually make use of that value as a number. What it's meant to be used as is just a placeholder that certain string functions will spit that out if they don't find stuff, right? So this is one of the situations where that gets spit out is if we look for something that does not exist anywhere in the string. We get all the way to you know, standard string in pos, no position. So again, we don't care about that number, but we do care about something that's, equivalent, that's equal to standard colon colon string colon colon in pos. So, um, the standard we could do without, but the string in pause is, is important. So what this is really saying is, again, colon colon is the scope resolution operator. So what's in pause? Well, in pause is, a, is something defined as part of string. And the string we're talking about is part of standard, but we're assuming standard with using namespace standard. OK? So, OK, there's still a lot going on here. So this is going to tell us, that if we hit this at all, right, it means that we found at least one space. So now what we want to do is we want to grab a subset. So now we've got this sub str for sub string, a smaller string, right? And the way that works is we, we, what we're saying is two things. We're saying the first index so we're going to start reading at some some place, and then this is this. The next thing we have to give it is how many characters to read. So if we if we start here, right? So it is random, right? So we know that it is two letters, right? We can just observe that directly, right? So if if we ask ourselves what's the index for the first space, we get zero. Index zero is i. Index one is t. Index two is the space, right? So we know we want to read two characters. So, and but let's step forward, right? So that gives us two, right? So let's say we um, we're reading the next one. So let's just say that we've done we've dealt with it, right? Now we want to deal with it. So ideally, what we want to do is we're going to start reading one over, right? 
So we want to go one beyond the first space. We, just, you know, we don't want to read the space twice. So we start with three, so that's i. Four, index four is s. And index five, we find another space. Now we know here, we, again, we want to read two characters. So what we're doing here is we're keeping track of where we started looking and where we found the next space. So here, if we subtract two from five, well, we get three, but if we subtract three from five, right, where we started looking, we went two spaces over to find the first space. So again, we read two more characters. So I know this is a little involved, but I'm starting out, so these two variables are there to hold where I'm starting, the, basically the first non-space character, and then the next, uh, the location of the next space. And if I subtract that, I get how many characters I need to read. So I start off, my, my starting space is at zero. Actually, to make this a little bit clearer, I'm going to do this. I'm going to say, rather than zero, I'm going to say prev pause. So that you'll see that this is exactly the same as this line. Because every time we, we go through the while loop, what we're doing is we're checking to see, do we have at least, do we have another space here? And if so, where is it? So if we don't have any spaces, this just stops, right? But if we do have at least one space, we want to find out where the next space is and read from there back to where we started. And then each time we do that, we update our pre prev pause, right? So we, we get a word, right? So this will give us the word. So if I see out that word, we're not making too much use of it just yet, but I'll see out word. Uh, actually, let's make this a little bit before I, all right, so, okay, so let's run that. Oh, sorry, guys, I, I'm not actually calling chatbot nicer. All right, so let's uh, make sure we call chatbot nicer. Okay, so I'm going to say it is raining. So we see prev is zero, space pause is two, we get it. Then we go prev is three, space pause is five, is. Now we're not getting the last word. I know, I, I know we're at 6.30, so I'll wrap this up, but uh, I want to at least get through this a little bit. So, uh, so that's almost working, except we just need to make sure that we get the last word two. Right, so it's pretty standard. So sort of like taking, you know, stepping back a little bit and looking at this, what I'm doing is I'm starting some value by testing something. Now I might, get a, I might hook a fish or I might not, essentially, right? I might have a space or I might not. If I hook a fish, let's say, I want to keep fishing until I've gotten all the fish I'm going to get, right? So uh, pretty standard thing to do, but so this is kind of like try to hook a fish. If you got one, Process and put your hook back in the water, right? But I might be left at the end of all that with a fish on my hook, and I want to deal with that fish too. Hopefully that makes sense. I try out new metaphors all the time, you know, some, some work, some don't. So what I got to do is I want to make sure that I read the rest of it. So I'm going to do one more thing here, and I'm going to say word equals, and it's going to be the same thing. I'm going to substring this whole thing. And um, prev pause gets updated each time, so that's fine. But instead of space pause, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to say input dot size minus prev pause. Because this last one, the, the diff what's different about it is instead of reading from where I started to the next space, I want to read from where I started to the end of the string. Okay, so now run this, and I'll say it is raining. 
Now we get, it is raining. So it's a little bit obscure because I've got extra statements there, but let's uh, clean this up a little bit. I'll get rid of those C-outs, I'll get rid of the C-out. And what I'll do is I'll say words.push push back word. And here I'll say words push back word. And then just to clarify what's going on, I'll say for int i equals zero, i less than words dot size, i plus plus, c out, words i, Okay, so if I say it is raining, I get it is raining. And now, you know, it's just, it's going on, right? So, um, so yeah, I'm spitting out the uh, full input. So that's why we're seeing it is raining as a sentence again. But if I say something like, you know, here it is a long sentence full of words. Here we get you know, it breaks it up, right? Okay, so um, unfortunately we're, at, we're out of time. Uh, so sorry that this, we kind of, we ran out of time early. But um, I, I will put the code up and just to talk through it, essentially what I'm doing is I'm just looking for, uh, checking to see if those words are in the array I got. And if they are, I, um, I skip them. And if they're not, I take the very first one and I break out. I take that as the subject and break out. So um, and I do some replacing, which maybe we'll, we'll finish that off next week. So OK, so uh, next week is spring break. I should say next meeting. Next week's spring break, right? So uh, no mandatory assignment. If, feel free, you know, relax, rest up. Uh, I did, though, I promised that I, I'd offer some extra credit. So there is an extra credit assignment for up to 50 points, which uh, you guys all got your progress grade, so you know how I'm calculating stuff, right? So should you do the extra credit, I'll grade it like a normal project, except it'll be worth 50 points, not 100. And I'll just tack that on. So next time I give you your, your grades and I add up your assignment total, if you do the extra credit, that'll just go on your assignment total, OK? And uh, it's on the website. It's just make, you know, take this as a jumping off point and make a chatbot. Uh, I will want to see more, I, I'm sorry we didn't get all the way through it, but uh, you know, I will want to see substantial additions to what's in the example I'll have online. But, uh, and again, it's totally optional. You don't have to do it. You want to just enjoy your spring break, that's totally cool. Okay? Okay. <laughs>